This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. One important reason the revolution was inevitable, Karl Marx thought, was that in a capitalist society, the labour force was alienated. Marx's critique of alienation was developed while he was in exile in France. The Industrial Revolution was underway, and the young Marx, for the first time, mingled with workers and was appalled by their poverty. Jonathan Wolfe is a professor at University College London and author of Why Read Marx Today. Jonathan Wolfe, welcome to Philosophy Bites. It's very nice to be back again. The topic we're going to focus on today is Karl Marx, but specifically Karl Marx on alienated labour. I wonder if you could paint the picture of Marx's concerns at the time he was writing about alienation. Marx's main work on alienation is a work known as the 1844 Manuscripts, also known as the Paris Manuscripts, also known as the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. Marx was trained as a philosopher. He was steeped in German philosophy, but also post-Aristotelian philosophy. He wrote a thesis on Epicurus and Democritus, but he couldn't get a job teaching philosophy in Germany. He was far too radical. He was an atheist. He kept the wrong company. So he began as a journalist, and as a journalist, he had to get very interested in politics. He had to write about the conditions of the peasants in Moselle. He had to write about laws against the theft of wood and so on. Looking at political issues radicalized him to such a degree that uh, he became very unpopular in Germany and had to leave. He moved to Paris. At this point, he had met Engels, and Engels convinced him that he really needed to study economics as well. That's the background to his writings on alienation. Colloquially, alienation is just being left out of something, really, isn't it? It's the sense that you're not part of a group, but that's not what he means. Alienation, it does sound like a feeling. You feel alienated from or alienated against, perhaps. So if we were to use the term alienation in ordinary language, we'd probably mean a feeling of exclusion. And that certainly is part of what Marx means by alienation. But for Marx, he takes it much, much further. He's not the first person to use the term alienation. It's a technical term in German philosophy. And Hegel used the term as well. The general idea is of things that belong together coming apart. Within German philosophy, the things that come apart are essence and existence. Could you just explain that a bit? The essence of what comes apart from the existence of what? Well, good question. For Marx, he's talking about the essence of human beings and the existence of human beings. Human beings have a particular essence in the sense of what would be the good or ideal life for human beings. And so for the essence to come apart from existence is merely to say that human beings are not living in accordance with the way they ought to live. But isn't that the human condition that we are always failing to achieve what we might achieve? Marx would say that's the human condition under capitalism, not necessarily the human condition, and that we can conceive of social situations in which human life is lived in accordance with its essence. This would be the goal of social thought and action, i.e. we do live the good life. We'll come back to what the good life might be, but for the time being, can we just try and separate out some of the strands of alienated labour? What is the worker characteristically alienated from under a capitalist society? In the 1844 manuscripts, Marx claims that the worker is alienated in four different ways under capitalism. OK, so let's take them one at a time. What's the first one? The first one is, in some ways, the most straightforward, is alienation from the product. Imagine someone on a production line or someone in a factory makes things and those things are taken away from the worker. The worker doesn't come to own them after having made them. Now, you might think that's just what capitalism is. Um, it's a system in which people are paid to produce things and someone else gets to own them. That's the nature of the system. But in a series of writings, it's clear Marx means something rather more dramatic. It's not just that the product is taken away from the worker, but rather the product sort of reappears in alien form. One thing to bear in mind on all the notions of alienation, it's not just that something is removed, two things come apart, but what is lost reappears in some sort of alien form. It will often be that something that is part of the human essence comes back to dominate or oppress human beings in some unexpected way. 
So let's take an example of that. The workers are on a production line making chairs. The chairs go out of the factory to a shop. How then are they alienated from those chairs? When Marx says the workers are alienated from their products, he doesn't necessarily mean only that each individual worker is alienated from the product made by that individual worker. Rather, it's better to read him as saying that workers collectively are alienated from the products of workers collectively. We often confront the world as if we're strangers to it. I'm looking at this rather interesting recording device here, a microphone. I have absolutely no idea how any of this works. This was an object that was invented by a human being, refined by many human beings. Thousands probably have been involved in the technology, millions in manufacturing the various bits over time that go together, and none of us have a clue about how it works unless we're experts. So in that way, we're alienated from these products. The economist Milton Friedman used to give the example of a pencil as an account of the miracle of capitalism. He would stand there, in fact, he did this on TV with a simple pencil with a rubber in the end, and he would say, no one on earth knows how to make a pencil. There are so many different technologies involved, yet we take it absolutely for granted. There is something more that needs to be said here. Part of the product isn't just these physical objects that we're making but also the social conditions under which we make them. One of the consequences of capitalist production is not just objects, but capitalism. That is a social structure in which some people are rich, some people are poor and have to work for the people who are rich. As the worker produces objects, these objects are appropriated by the capitalist who sells them for profit and becomes richer. So the capitalist then has even greater power over the worker. The more the worker produces, the more the worker is producing the means of his own domination. To take this even further, think now of the capitalist system as a whole. Now we're used to the idea that there are booms and busts, there are recessions. Why is that? Why do we have an economy which seems to be out of control in this way? Because after all, what is the economy? The economy is just a lot of human beings taking decisions, acting in what they think is the most rational way. But what seems to happen is that there are times in history when everyone acting in what seems a rational way to them comes close to bringing down the system as a whole. And Marx says that we become playthings of alien forces. But the fact about them, the metaphysics of these forces, is that they are our own product. Capitalism is a monster that controls us, that we create it. So this really, I think, is the notion of alienation from the products at its deepest for Marx. But it's not just the product, it's the process that is alienating in some sense as well for Marx. Yes, exactly. That brings us to the second distinct category of alienation, which Marx calls alienation from productive activity. And here he has particularly production line technology in mind. Human beings in producing reduce themselves to a level of a machine so that human beings have this tremendous potential. Human beings can, Marx says, even create in accordance with the laws of beauty. But for most workers under capitalism, certainly as Marx saw it, they didn't exercise their will or consciousness or design. They were just told what to do, act in a mechanical way. And Marx says that although human beings are essentially productive, we feel most human when we're away from work, when we are eating, drinking and procreating, which is a sort of parody of what human life should be because we should be at our most human when we're creative and working. But there are two more senses of alienation that Marx also focuses on beyond the alienation of the product and of the process of producing the product. That's right. So just to run through all four, two we've already looked at, alienation from the product, alienation in productive activity, alienation from species essence and alienation from other human beings. Now, all of these categories are somewhat merged together, but we've got to the third one now, which is alienation from species essence. What Marx means by this is that human beings, as a species, have a particular essence. There are things about human beings that are distinctive to those human beings. And Marx claims that under capitalism, the the vast majority of human beings don't enjoy their essence and their daily activity. For Marx, the essence splits into two. Part of it is the notion of what is special about human beings, what distinguishes human beings from animals in terms of what can we do. And here, a point we've already touched on, Marx says that human beings are essentially creative. What is it that distinguishes 
the worst architect from the best bee. Bees make hives. Right? Many animals produce things. We do the same thing. But we learn from each other. One generation is better at producing things than the previous generation. You'll only get better beehives if you get better bees. But you can get better buildings without better human beings because we've just passed on this knowledge. So what's that got to do with alienation? Well, it's simply that under capitalism, the vast majority of us are not able to do that, i.e., this part of our essence is not enjoyed as part of our existence. So that's alienation from half of our species' essence. The other half of our species' essence is a point we've also seen about the division of labor. What makes human life livable is that we don't have to produce everything for ourselves, that we're part of this incredibly complex division of labor. Marx and other economists have distinguished two different forms of division of labor. One is a social division of labor. Some people make shoes, some people make hats, and you exchange it. Then there's division of labor within the workplace, whereby you get great specialization of task. A very famous example of this, Adam Smith wrote about a pin factory whereby a factory had divided the making of a pin into about eight or ten separate tasks done by different people. And through this division of labor, human beings are able to produce vast quantities of goods. And although Marx doesn't put it exactly this way, a way of thinking about it is to imagine alien looking down on human life and seeing people going to shops, people going to work, and not understanding money. And to think, well, what human beings have achieved is this incredible global system of cooperation. You know, the Martians might think, how wonderful human beings can cooperate in this fantastic way. They're all doing these things for each other. As we've said, making a pencil involves so many different technologies, so much knowledge, so many different people. Somehow we coordinate all of this, but we don't realize that we coordinate it. So for the ordinary person, the unreflective person, they go to work, they get some money, and they go to shops, and they buy things with that money, and they're cut off from this incredible division of labor that we're all part of. So this is why Marx says we're alienated from other human beings. As a matter of course, we're not thinking about everyone else that we are relying on. So we've now dealt with all four senses of alienation for Marx. What would it be like to live in a non-alienated way? Well, Marx was never very clear about what a non-alienated society would be. Partly this was deliberate. He thought that it was very important to distinguish scientific socialism from what he called utopian socialism. The utopian socialists had an idea about what the good society would be and thought that the goal of socialism was to somehow wrestle society towards this ideal scheme. But Marx thinks of this as a form of well, idealism and that a scientific socialism is one where we see history unfold in a particular direction and we understand the real social forces, the causes behind history. But we don't have a vision of what the good society is. We rather let that emerge from the historical process itself. So Marx said it's not for him to write the recipes for the cookshops for the future. That does sound a bit of a cop-out. Well, fair point. There are a few texts where Marx gives us a clue. The most famous, most notorious of these is the German ideology, which was a co-written work with Engels. In this text, they say that in the society of the future, no one will have any particular role. So you can hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, or criticize after dinner without ever being a hunter, fisherman, or critical critic. Now, this text has been ridiculed. One reason for this is that it creates a rather pastoral view of what the society of the future would be. Another problematic aspect of this text is that there's nothing like it anywhere else in Marx. And a Japanese scholar took a very close look at the text of the German ideology. And the text itself is written in a number of different hands. So some of it is written by Marx, and that's almost impossible to read. Some of it is in Engels' handwriting, and some of it is in Marx's wife's handwriting. Now, Marx's working method quite often was to pace around the room dictating. It said that Marx couldn't read his own handwriting. Now, this passage is in Engels' handwriting. And in Engels' handwriting, it says, in the society of the future, you can hunt in the morning and fish in the afternoon. Then in Marx's handwriting, the little carrot, it says, or criticize after dinner. Now, what do we make of this? One scholar, Terrell Carver, thinks that this is Marx making a joke at Engels' expense. Marx's way of saying, don't be so silly, this is not what we believe, we can't put this in the book. And so we have this irony that one of Marx's most famous texts was actually written by Engels, and Marx's contribution to it was to tell him to throw it away. 
Jonathan Wolfe, thank you very much. My pleasure. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.